Bonjour et bienvenue à ILARA, l'Institut des langues rares de l'École pratique des hautes études PSL. Hello and welcome to ILARA, our institute whose aim is to showcase the rare and precious ancient and contemporary languages of the world. Nicolas Tiberger's talk will be in English, but I'll introduce our institute in French first, as usual. ILARA est un institut créé en août 2020 par arrêté du ministère français de l'enseignement supérieur de la recherche et de l'innovation. <coughs> Sa mission est de sensibiliser et former le grand public aux langues rares, anciennes et contemporaines, et à leur culture. L'ILARA participe aussi à la valorisation et la sauvegarde de ces langues, notamment à travers des actions de documentation. Deux offres principales sont actuellement disponibles pour tous les publics. D'une part, une offre de cours d'initiation, de découverte et d'approfondissement en présentiel à Paris, et étant donné la situation encore en visioconférence pour un moment. Dans quelques jours débute d'ailleurs le cycle de cours sur les langues des Monts-Nouba, et il est encore temps de s'inscrire. Puis nous préparerons l'offre du second semestre, avec notamment une superbe série sur les judéolangues contemporaines. L'autre partie de l'offre consiste en un ensemble de vidéoconférences virtuelles, l'ILARA en ligne, disponibles sur notre chaîne, et dont la première série, les invitations de l'ILARA, met à l'honneur des spécialistes de renommée internationale sous forme d'entretiens ou de conférences. D'autres séries seront bientôt proposées et un appel à participation lancé. Dans ce cadre des invitations de l'ILARA, Scott Delancey a ouvert notre série fin octobre <coughs> en nous faisant découvrir les subtilités des langues d'Asie, puis Nick Evans nous initiait aux complexités de la langue aborigène d'Alabon, d'Australie, suivi de Félix Ameka, qui nous présentait quelques joyaux linguistiques des langues d'Afrique de l'Ouest. Il y a trois semaines, nous découvrions la diversité linguistique du Caucase avec Bernard Comrie, puis la semaine suivante, Bruna Franchetto nous donnait un aperçu des riches arts verbaux musicaux des Kuekuro de l'Amazonie brésilienne. La semaine dernière, nous sommes remontés vers l'Amérique du Nord avec Marianne Mithun pour un panorama de la diversité des langues amérindiennes dans cette vaste zone. Notre premier tour du monde des langues rares contemporaines s'étant achevé, il s'agit maintenant d'aborder une question cruciale, comment préserver les enregistrements collectés dans toutes ces langues autochtones pour les générations futures Cette question est au cœur du travail de Nick Tiberger, professeur à l'Université de Melbourne. Il dirige le consortium Paradisec, une des plus importantes archives de langues autochtones au monde. Linguiste de formation, auteur dans les années 90 d'une grammaire de Nafsan à l'architecture pionnière, puisqu'elle était reliée à l'ensemble des enregistrements constituant sa base de données et permettait donc de vérifier les hypothèses proposées, il s'est très tôt intéressé à la gestion des données de terrain et au corpus électronique. Il est éditeur de la revue en ligne Language Documentation and Conservation, qui est une mine de publications en accès libre portant sur la documentation, la préservation et la revitalisation des langues autochtones. Nick, bienvenue à l'ILARA et merci d'avoir accepté de clore ce premier cycle d'invitation par une présentation en forme de bilan et d'ouverture qui s'accorde bien avec la période de l'année dans laquelle nous sommes. Welcome to you all. Nick Tibaga is about to start his talk, during which you'll be able to ask your questions in French or in English in the live chat. Please share your comments and participate. Mark Tang will, as usual, interact with you and will forward your contributions to Nick. Nick, thank you for accepting to talk about this crucial question about how to preserve, of how to preserve precious recordings of indigenous languages for future generations. We are very grateful and eager to know more about that. Thank you very much. So, so thank you, uh, Amina, and uh, for this opportunity to to talk and uh, to follow such a, a a a group of luminaries talking about the the genius of um, languages from around the world. Uh, so, as Amina said, I want to try and put that into a different context so that we have all these wonderful studies and this wonderful knowledge of these languages, but there are many records uh, of these languages that we need to be able to look after into the future. I want to begin by paying my respect to the Woiwurrung people, the traditional owners of the land that I work on, um, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. 
And I want to suggest that creating language records is actually uh, an act of social justice. Uh, that we, as, as, as an Australian, um, we're particularly um, aware of the massive aggression and uh, injustice that was caused to the Indigenous people of Australia. A language loss is just one aspect of the colonial enterprise. And, you know, we can, I think, in academia, act in a post-colonial manner so that we don't just replicate the Elgin marbles and keep extracting material from um, other parts of the world for our benefit. Linda Tuiwai Smith is a Maori theorist, and she writes that imperialism and colonialism brought complete disorder to colonised people, uh, disconnecting them from their histories, their landscapes, and their languages. And I think probably our audience uh, is well aware of uh, the loss of language uh, that has occurred as a result of colonial expansion throughout the world. But she says that uh, to discover how fragmented this process was, one needs only to stand in a museum, a library or a bookshop and ask where Indigenous people are located. And so for this talk, I also want to ask where are the language records located? I taught at the University of Hawaii for a while and had a student there from um, Polap um, in Chuk in Micronesia. And in one of her term papers, she wrote, whatever happens to the previous research, what benefits were they to our community? Were researchers who seek to get their PhDs merely exploiting us or was it for a greater good? When do we see products and results and not more study? This was Paulina Yurupi. So, I think this is a, a challenge that uh, we need to, to think about. So preparing language records, I say, is an act of restitution and social justice. Um, so it's an important act from a social justice perspective, but there is also good research methodology involved in preparing primary records so that they can be cited. Um, and then allowing other research questions to be put uh, based on the records, even if the analysis that's written doesn't touch on a particular topic. We know that new theoretical interests lead, leading to descriptions of, for example, evidentials, mirativity, you know, switch reference, all these things were came in sort of waves of fashion. And if a grammar was written before these fashions, then these, these topics weren't addressed. But if the grammar was written uh, together with building a collection of material that was accessible, other people could go into those um, corpora collections and conduct uh, research of their own on that material. I recorded my parents talking about their lives. These recordings are on my computer and several hard disks or online servers. I want to be sure that my children can listen to them sometime and maybe later their children can too. I can make lots of copies and make sure the files are on different hard drives and online storage, but none of this really ensures the files will be there in 10, 20 or 100 years. I've also recorded speakers of different languages from Australia and the Pacific. The content of my parents' stories is important to me, just as the content of the recordings I've made would be important to the families of the people I recorded. But while my parents were speaking a language with millions of speakers, these other languages I've recorded have far fewer speakers. They're some of the rare languages that Ilara focuses on. Some have no remaining speakers, some have a few hundred or a few thousand. So I've become increasingly focused on how to make recordings like these accessible and secure into the future. Archival standards and systems exist for data, but at least in Australia, no current institution took the responsibility of looking after these materials. So in 2003, I was part of a team that set out to digitize tapes and to build the systems needed to keep adding new tapes and making them accessible. At that time, there were few language archives, but there are more since then. So recordings made in the past on wax cylinder, wire, tapes, film, CDs, DAT, and so on, now need to be found and digitized before they can become, before, before they become unplayable. In fact, it's currently a kind of detective job to locate uh, the records that we know were made in the past. 
So as Amina said, um, I'm talking from the perspective of Paradisic and also the ARC Centre of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language. So two projects in Australia that um, deal with um, language and, and creating records of languages. And I called my talk before us the deluge and I suppose because it was French I thought of um, après moi le déluge um, so after us the deluge so that we don't care what happens after us basically the idea is that um, whether it was Charles de Gaulle or whether it was Louis XV somebody said it and uh, the idea is and maybe it's a bit cruel to suggest that linguists really don't care what happens after um, they've done their work but uh, if we look at the number of records available for languages in some sense uh, it is true so before us, the deluge, before us, how many languages have there been on the earth? I did a back of the envelope calculation and I was talked to Kim Sterelny, a, a colleague who works on language evolution. And I came up with a figure of a million languages. Um, but I then went and looked up some sources and find that uh, the estimates are a lot lower than that. But between 60,000 and half a million languages spoken on the earth ever. So before us, half a million languages and what trace is there of those languages? But before us today, 7,000 languages here on earth with us today and what trace will there be of these languages in the future? So we can create sets of records that in, can inform future research as well as, as I said, um, performing a social justice function. And we work here in um, the Centre of Excellence. We have developed, and Jane Simpson is the one who's really formulated this, the idea of an assemblage of materials from which a collection is derived and from which a corpus can be derived. So there are three sort of stages at which there are materials that are created in the course of fieldwork. Um, and not all of them necessarily need to be preserved for all time. But the collection really is the thing that we focus on and the corpus is a sort of refined aspect of that so textual material that can be used for interrogating um, you know grammatical issues uh, and Nicholas Himmelman's gone even further and uh, has quite a detailed argument in uh, LDNC language documentation and conservation where he talks about raw primary secondary and structural data so in my work um, I, on the language Nafsan or South Efate from central Vanuatu, I've created a, a number of different materials and this is sort of typical of what a linguist's work would involve. So gloss text, images of people, images of plants. I've also collected historical manuscripts in the language, Bible translations and so on. I've written a dictionary and I've written a grammar. All of this is archived and it has licenses which allow people to know how they can use it. The great thing about this is that it has now become the basis for analysis by a number of other researchers. So Rosie Billington is a phonetician and she's done very detailed phonetic analysis of this language and gone on to do field work uh, as well. Anna Krinovich similarly uh, began work on the corpus and then uh, developed questionnaires and uh, research questions and went into the field to do an analysis of tense um, and mood and aspect. The corpus has been used in the grade analysis, Stefan Schnell and his colleagues at Bamberg. Uh, it's used in the Dorico project that Frank Seifert and others run. Uh, Kilu von Prince has written on habituality using material from the corpus and Emily Bender has used the corpus for her uh, grammar inference project. So all of this research is based on the fact that the corpus, the collection is created in a way that allows it to be reused and it's archived so that other people can access it. So in the past, I think, uh, we have been guilty of extracting information for our own benefit and we're open to the criticism that Paulina Urupi makes uh, that this is, uh, there is very little to show for this work back in the communities that we uh, did the work in. So even though we don't take phys physical artefacts, we nevertheless have a responsibility to act reciprocally. 
So I suggest that it's not enough just to write academic work based on collaboration with speakers and to leave nothing of use to them. In the past, analog tapes were not easily distributed, uh, unlike digital files, which can now be copied from phone to phone. And as Thomas Jefferson said, you know, he who receives an idea from me receives instruction without lessening mine, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. So digital, um, the digitization of uh, all of the material that we work with allows it to be distributed in a way that simply wasn't possible before. So this is uh, something that, you know, we should be able to take advantage of now. And digitization is, of course, also important for preservation. So if we think of the National Museum of Brazil, which burned down just over a year ago, many, many uh, unique analog records were stored in that building and were destroyed, including many language records. So um, making copies, keeping copies in other places, of course, is very important. So why do we need records? Well, as I think I've made clear, my position is that writing a grammar is of little or no use to the people we've worked with. But the family connection is important and locating images or recordings of your own family uh, is, is something that people do want to do. And if they know that if a linguist has worked in their community, there should be some records somewhere. The records that we create are also a cultural reflection um, and they provide a, a way that um, can reintroduce, uh, revitalize oral tradition uh, if uh, it hasn't been uh, passed on within the communities. And also it presents information on the internet in a way that these languages typically aren't represented. And as speakers of these languages increasingly get mobile phones, increasingly visit the internet and look for uh, reflections of their own languages and cultures, uh, I think it would be great if they could actually find them. Records are also important from a linguistic point of view for taxonomy. Uh, just having information about as many languages as possible in accessible forms. Um, there is a scientific method that you know, allows for replicability, but in, in our case, probably verifiability of analyses by going back to the, um, the records. So traditionally, we would have an example sentence as the single exemplar of a particular grammatical feature. Um, and, you know, it's hard to know what the status of that particular example is, but if we have it in context and if we have many examples that we can search for, that gives us um, a, a better verif verification of the analysis uh, and a stronger analysis. Just play you uh, this audio track. That's uh, the only recording we have of a Tasmanian Aboriginal language when it was spoken um, over 100 years ago. Languages have been revived in Tasmania, but this is the only recording of the language when it was spoken every day. So you can go into the museum in Hobart in Tasmania and you can find this display with the wax cylinder recordings. Um, but that is all that we have of that language. And I think we can do better than that today. So the existing records that we know about are things like manuscripts, um, books, obviously films and videos, audios, uh, and also currently community generated material. So people in, as I said, they've got mobile phones, uh, they're generating a lot of records in their own languages. Uh, there's this excellent site which looks at all the Twitter feeds in as many different languages um, as it can. It finds minority language uh, use of Twitter. Um, but all of these sources, Twitter and other social media, are ephemeral. And there isn't, as far as I know, any um, repository that's taking, repos uh, taking responsibility for looking after this material. Now, a colleague of mine was talking about depositing his material in the archive, and he said, you know, this is an email that I have from him, that he was definitely interested in depositing, uh, but 
he's just angsting about how much work he would have to do to make his material deposit worthy. And unfortunately, he died before he deposited any material. So I would really encourage you not to worry too much about making your material deposit worthy, or maybe we should all think about our work practices so that everything we do allows us to deposit our materials as soon as we create them. Uh, we did eventually find his um, recording. So this is Terry Crowley, our, our much lamented uh, departed colleague. And here's a recording of his. I'll, I'll play you a few recordings through this talk just to give you a sense of what is in the archive. So it's not just me talking all the time. So rather than waiting until after we retire or unfortunately maybe die, um, we can archive our materials at the beginning of our research project. So here's an example. This is um, a collection of uh, DVDs, CDs that were sent from the field by Laura Robinson, who was doing her field work in the northern Philippines. Her field site was a little bit dangerous and she moved around a bit. But before she left, she identified what her naming convention would be for files and she sent these um, recordings. So then we had these recordings in the archive and she was able to base her research on, on these recordings and cite them in a way that allowed others to retrace her steps to that material. And it was already archived when she came back from the field. So that's a great example. So CDs and DVDs are fairly fragile, but tape is particularly fragile. So all the early analog recordings, um, we are told by specialists that they only have a, another four or five years uh, before they start falling apart. So there's a document from the National Film and Sound Archive in Australia called No Tape Left Behind, the deadline of 2025. And it points out the urgency of locating and digitizing tapes. And there you can see a tape uh, that has split apart, basically. The magnetic media has fallen off the polyester as it's played through the machine. Now, linguistics has gone through a change in the 90, since the 1990s. We've had this big push for language documentation, this term that we've heard a few times already, uh, based on you know, Ken Hale's um, article in language, uh, Michael Krauss's speech and article in language, and of course, Nicholas Himmelman's uh, foundational article. Uh, in addition, that has led to two big funding projects, the Dobes project out of Germany of 28 million euros, and the ELDP uh, project funded by Arcadia um, out of London. So these projects have funded a great deal of research and they've also mandated archiving of the results. And the Dobes project in particular has produced uh, tools and, uh, you know, really has promoted um, archiving and uh, the ELD pro ELDP project continues uh, today. So we have a choice really bet of choosing between the evanescence of the digital, that is the digital is fragile, we know that, or the senescence of the analogue. And this is, uh, the issue is that we're now using digital devices. Everything that we're creating is now digital. And uh, we absolutely need special ways of capturing that material. And we need ways of ensuring that it will be available in the future, knowing how very fragile digital data is and the various formats that we use um, to store it are. Um, so I mentioned Dobes. There's the Dobes uh, website and ELDP, um, their website. So these are archives for language, music, ethnographic records. Uh, in Paris, there's uh, Cocoon uh, and uh, the Pangloss collection. Uh, these are wonderful and uh, long-term archives. These have all been going for, for some time now. 
And each of them has their particular focus or um, strengths, uh, you know, the way that they present material, the way that they uh, accept material from uh, researchers. Uh, the Archive of the Indigenous Languages of Latin America is, based, is in Texas, but um, has, as you can see, a um, bilingual uh, website which uh, and really focuses on um, Spanish-speaking parts of Latin America. So all of these efforts have resulted in um, funding and tool development. So we have some excellent tools that allow us to create and annotate linguistic data. So Elan and Fieldworks Language Explorer or FLEX produced by the Summer Institute of Linguistics. Um, and these are all part of now of the suite of tools that I think most uh, linguists are using. And because they all produce files in the same format, it means that they can be archived and the archives know how to deal with these files. This is a, a snapshot of some of the members of the Digital Endangered Language and Musics Archives Network, or Dalaman, which is a, a grouping of these uh, archives from around the world and you can see that there is a spread of them but there is still not enough. Uh, we need lots more archives. Um, there's one now in India, one is planned for Tahiti, um, there is one for northeast India that's based in Texas, uh, there's one in uh, Yaoundé in Cameroon but we, we need many more uh, language archives in the world. We're also very lucky to have the Open Language Archives community. This is a great service for uh, linguists. It's a community of some 60 archives and it's a free service. So they've established um, a way of using a metadata schema or cataloging schema so that um, people can, each archive can use this standard metadata and then OLAC harvests that metadata every day and then it creates for each language in the world a page which lists all the material that's available in the archives. And there's a page for the South Ifata language and you can see the URL has this three letter code. Each language, most languages in the world have a three letter code. And you can um, put that onto that URL and get that page. Uh, and each archive that participates in this, if they enter some new information today, this page will be refreshed uh, tomorrow. It's a wonderful service. Uh, maybe I'll just stop there for a moment in case there are any questions. Um, is there anybody that wants to ask a question? If not, I'll just keep going. Okay, so because we have this wonderful infrastructure of OLAC, we can, so, so OLAC uses these three letter codes. And why do we need three letter codes when we have perfectly good language names? Well, here's an example. Um, language names can also be common names. So here we have language names, a whole list of language names. Um, but, you know, if you search, if you did um, Google searches for these words, you can see that you would find a lot of other stuff before you found the language name. And computationally, if we wanted to be able to extract information, uh, we wouldn't be able to do it using uh, these words. And then there are languages uh, that have the same name. So here we have different languages in different countries that all share the same name. So using codes, these three letter codes, means that we can distinguish uh, each of these languages and then we can write services that target just those languages, just like the one that we saw with OLAC. Now, these, these codes are far from perfect and they've been criticized, uh, often quite justifiably, um, and we need to improve them. But nevertheless, th that's what we have at the moment. Uh, Glottolog, which is another service, uh, has a more fine-grained set of codes, um, and we hope that in the future, OLAC will use Glottolog codes as well. One of the problems that we have is that there are sources for languages in libraries, but the libraries don't have good ways of identifying languages. So the National Library of Australia here has 
the language identifier here says that it's Austronesian other. That's not very specific. Above it, it has Ifate language as a subject, but in the language um, descriptor, it says uh, Austronesian other. Uh, the British Library here, we can look at a, a New Testament um, again in that same language, and there's nothing in here that gives you a, a language identifier. So you would have to search through, um, well, you would be lucky if it was in the title, uh, but there is no language identifier there. Uh, another example, this is from the uh, Humboldt University in uh, Berlin, uh, has um, material which is meant to be in Tahitian, Polynesian, but comes from Australia. So it's unclear what that is, and without a more explicit language identifier, uh, it's not really possible to identify what this language actually is. Here's another snippet for you. You can see that the quality of these recordings is also this is this is taken from tape um, and in the hands of people who knew what they were doing and making these recordings, um, they're really quite wonderful quality. So we can take the uh, OLAC material and put it to work. So I've written this service uh, called the OLAC Visualizer, and it can scrape the information from those OLAC pages and it can summarize them in this way. So here we can see that uh, for this language, we have this many primary texts, this many lexical resources uh, and so on. Um, so this gives you a sort of an overview by language, which is quite useful. And you can then visualize um, that, you know, by assigning colors to the number of resources available for a language. Um, and you can do things like this. This is now online. You can go and explore OLAC using this, which uh, shows you what the language descriptions are, the lexical resources and, and um, primary texts and so on for a particular language. And this is done by scraping the um, OLAC data. Uh, what this also lets you do um, is look at, um, take time slices. So here we have uh, dates. This is a, taking the same material uh, of OLAC over time. So we could look at OLAC from two years ago or, or, and look at each language and see what has changed for that language. And here you can see the number of uh, items for uh, particular languages. And you know that a language that has had work done on it has typically more uh, records in it than uh, a language that has had very little work done on it. And we can then put this onto a map, say for example, um, Google Maps, and have this nice visualization where uh, green icons, big ones are, you know, languages with lots of material, and the little white icons that you can see are languages with virtually no information. So you can fly through, see how much information there is, see the location of each of the languages, and then uh, if you're interested in a particular language, you should be able to go and, and click and be taken off to other places to, to see what information is available there. So do we have any questions now? Ah, so there's a question there from Mandana Safadinapur. How can we get the hidden material into the archives? Let me talk a bit more, and if I haven't answered your question by the end, uh, we can return to it, because I will be talking about these kinds of issues. Um, so, what I wanted to test is how much has the post-Himmelman world, the language documentation theory, infested our, acti our, our, our work? How much are we taking it seriously? So if we can look at the amount of information available in OLAC, and we could look at 
grammars that have been produced in the, in the recent past. So Glottolog, as I said, is this wonderful resource and Robert Forkel kindly made available to me um, the data on how many grammars have been produced since 1967 and you can see that 1857 grammars produced. But to be fair, let's look at the post Himmelman or the post 1990s and look at the number of grammars produced from 2000 until 2020 and that's 832 grammars. And of those 832 languages, 661 have few, 40 or fewer items in an OLAC repository. That is, the vast majority have very few items in an OLAC repository. Now, they may be in a non-OLAC repository. They may be in a library somewhere that doesn't participate in the open language archives community. That's quite possible. But nevertheless, it's a bit scary that a lot of material is being produced and it is not being archived. Um, and then if we take away the hundred languages that were funded, and that obviously the most likely more languages funded by Dobes or ELDP, that means that about 90% of the languages worked on in the recent past have too few um, records in the archives. So there's still a massive job to be done just with our colleagues. Uh, this isn't about finding tapes and digitizing them. This is about encouraging people to change their work practices so that they will deposit material and that it's easy for them to do that. I would suggest that it is now much easier than it has ever been to create good records of languages. Uh, we've got good tools for transcription, for glossing and aligning texts. The equipment we use is portable and easy to use uh, lots of conventions and standards that are established and ubiquitous and there are many training courses to encourage people to use them and there are many archives and of course we need more but there are archives around that you can work with. So in my work on Nassan, I've as I've shown I tried to build a reusable corpus uh, and I started in the 1990s when few tools were available but uh, as Amina said in the introduction in my Grammar of Nafsan, I put a lot of effort into citing each example sentence to its source. So you can see for each example sentence, there is a media reference um, there. But citation on its own needs a f is no good unless there's a destination for that citation. You need to have somewhere that somebody can go to to listen. So in the grammar, I did produce a DVD that you could listen to, but obviously that's not ideal. So with colleagues, we set about building the Pacific and Regional Archive for Digital Sources in Endangered Cultures or Paradisic, recognizing that we needed somewhere for material to be located so that it could be cited. This archive has now been running for 18 years. We continue to find and digitize, digitize analog tapes. We've got automated processes for ingestion of material and for access to material. Um, and we also produce um, access versions. So WAV files are uh, in the archive and we produce MP3 for delivery across the web because it's lower requires lower bandwidth. So this is an archive that's built by researchers, musicologists and linguists um, and it has been running for a long time and it now has somewhere around 110 terabytes of material as you can see from the stats there. You can see on the map that the focus of it has been uh, the Pacific and in particular Papua New Guinea because that's where many of the early researchers from Australia worked. Uh, Papua New Guinea was um, a real target for many Australian uh, linguists. But, and you can see that we have somewhere around 13 and a half thousand hours of audio. Uh, it's a huge and significant collection and the amount of video is increasing uh, considerably now, especially that people are depositing um, their video from fieldwork. About half of the audio that we hold um, is digitized by us. Uh, the rest is born digital. Um, and there's our website. Uh, the catalog is online. You can, you know, the catalog has the sort of functionality that you would expect really. You can search it. Um, it has um, links to the files. Um, it has a faceted search, so you can search by uh, content language or country. 
uh, you can resolve down to the level of the object. So you can re resolve down to uh, there's a manuscript uh, or if there's video, you can see the video. Uh, if there's audio, then um, especially if the audio has a transcript, then you can see them together. So the reason that you can see the transcript and the audio playing together is because the transcript is in Elan, it's in a standard format, and our viewer knows how to read Elan files, <coughs> excuse me, and can pre present them in this way. So the advantage of a language archive is that it understands linguistic data types and it's able to present them in this way. Uh, we have a geographic point of entry, so you can draw a bounding box on a map and that then is uh, becomes searchable. We have uh, language, identify, language names here and you can see the three letter codes for the languages. We also allow the language to be entered in whatever form you want, so obviously standard names are not always the way that the local people um, refer to their language so you can put whatever language name you want in there you can put um, villages in as well uh, to make it all searchable make it as maximally findable as possible we have apis from our catalog that is ways that external services can read our catalog and so there's the open language archive community feed and we have another feed at the collection level uh, which is to services in Australia. So the National Library of Australia can read our catalogue. If you search the National Library of Australia catalogue, you'll find material in Paradisec. Research Data Australia is another service that um, uh, will um, take um, Paradisec records and you can find material there. So again, we're trying to make the records in our collection as findable as possible. Sorry. So this is a, an interesting recording. It was made in 1960 by Arthur Capel, who um, was a professor of linguistics at Sydney, one of the, um, the first a very early uh, linguist and the quality of that recording is is remarkably good uh, but what's interesting is that uh, we have a Papua New Guinea national who works in our Sydney office Stephen Gagau and he listened to this recording because it's meant to be in his language um, and he was able to say that it's not in his language and he added information to the catalogue and this is another aspect of uh, digital archives is that um, there's an immediacy to uh, being able to listen and to comment on material for authorized users and he was able then to go in and add his comments into the catalog as well uh, these are the people behind the original um, application for paradisic and this is a mix of musicologists and linguists and uh, technologists um, a very satisfying thing about Paradisic is that of the records in OLAC, for these languages and for a number of languages, most of the material that's in OLAC actually comes from Paradisic. So the language Jingpo, um, there are 800 and, 1830 languages in OLAC, and of those, 1805 are in Paradisic. So the, it's a significant uh, collection, it's contributed a significant amount of records to our knowledge of these languages um, and yeah over the last four years we've had 34,000 downloads you can see the number of registered users and so on but we're really really keen to try and build up the number of um, people who can access it from the region so in particular the Pacific region and it is good that we've got this many from various Pacific um, countries uh, but that's something that we want to work on more. We have got good links with um, agencies in the Pacific. Um, yeah, you can see them listed there. And with each of these, we have uh, cooperated on um, digitizing tapes, 
or assisting in uh, collection management for these agencies. Because uh, here's an example from the Solomon Islands Museum. All along the walls of this office are tapes, but there is no playback machinery at the Solomon Islands Museum. And um, being in the tropics, tapes can uh, suffer, and we'll see in a minute uh, what they look like when they suffer in this way. So we had uh, a couple of projects with the Solomon Islands National Museum. We were funded by the Endangered Archives Program to digitise these tapes. And we do this so that these can be re returned to the Solomon Islands Museum as digital files. Here's a, a, an example of a speaker of language finding these tapes. This is Eava Gator, who was in Melbourne studying and uh, came to my office and started listening to recordings in his language, Koita, Koita, and discovered relatives speaking the language and was visibly moved by by this and then I gave him copies uh, on a memory stick and he says he didn't sleep that night because he was just spending all his time listening to the recordings and you know this was a uh, it's an he says it's an amazing experience from a feeling of awe to emotion to deep excitement uh, knowing that your language has been documented or recorded kept safely somewhere in the world hearing hearing it spoken 50 or 60 years ago and so on so this is very gratifying and really it's uh, one of the great motivators for the, um, doing this work. So how do we find these materials? We have a project called Lost and Found where we periodically ask people to fill in a survey if they know of collections of recordings that need digitising and uh, archiving. And we do get responses to this um, periodically. So here are some examples of found collections. So. Don Kulik, very famous uh, work uh, in Papua New Guinea. Um, his tapes uh, were sitting in uh, his house or his office. And, and uh, Zygmunt Freisinger, tapes from North Africa, and two collections from uh, Vanuatu, Wolfgang Sperlich and Lamont Lindstrom. And these tapes were otherwise not going to be digitised. An interesting collection too is Ian Fraser's uh, collection of Toabaita tapes, 280 tapes. He's an anthropologist who worked uh, with the Toabaita people. That's a language that's quite famous because of the work that Frank uh, Lichtenberg did uh, and produced a beautiful grammar and dictionary. But we don't have any of Frank's recordings. So we have the dictionary and the grammar, and now we also have uh, a big collection of audio recordings. So there's a lot of music in the collection as well. Um, this is David Goldsworthy, a musicologist, and a big collection of really beautiful material there too. Finding these tapes and shipping them around and arranging meetings with people, it just made me feel like I was in a detective novel. So I just wrote this very brief vignette. <laughs> um, to try and capture the, the sense of um, doing deals and dropping off tapes and carrying tapes through customs at airports and picking up tapes in peculiar locations. Um, but yeah, there we go. So here are some of those tapes. Um, these are this is uh, Ambong Thompson at the Vanuatu Cultural Centre receiving the tapes after they've been digitised. This is uh, uh, Tony Herioke at the Solomon Islands Museum receiving tapes. These tapes are in Madang in Papua New Guinea. These are tapes by Father John Scruggan that are held in the Basel Museum uh, and we arranged for them to be digitised. These are tapes from Kalgoorlie in Western Australia. This is a collection of tapes by Helen Vorm, who was a, an anthropologist, and these are sitting in the library at the ANU and they haven't yet been digitised. We're still trying to find funding to digitise them. This is part of the deluge before us. Another aspect of the deluge, as I said, is uh, the damage that's done to tapes if they are left uh, in the tropics. And here's a mould affected tape. 
uh, if that's not cleaned it, be it's, it becomes unplayable and the tape as you saw before the tape falls apart um, another example of a badly damaged tape here um, it wasn't spooled properly and the tape has wrapped around inside uh, the spool and has got all scrunched that's the technical term and um, we thought this tape would be unplayable but Nick Fowler Gilmore our audio technician managed to get this audio signal out of it <laughs> Sorry. So you can see that the quality of that is amazing. Um, it's, it's what can be done. So don't think that your tapes are unplayable. Um, always please bring them to somebody that can, can work on them and fix them. A problem with a lot of the early tapes is there's just not very much information on them. So here's an example of uh, a tape. We have many like this, and this is the only information we have about what's on that tape. There's no other metadata. So we will digitize that and put that into the collection, but it's very difficult to find that. It's very difficult for others to locate information like that because um, it doesn't have much information. So it means that you know if you want to try and find information um, about your grandmother, uh, what recording is it going to be on? Is it on that one? Is it on that one? Is it on that one? We we don't know. So we have to have better ways of collect uh, creating collections. And we've worked on a tool. So uh, this is work on a tool called La Meta, which is a joint work between um, uh, basically a project run by Mandana Zafadinpour, Gary Holton and myself and coding is done by John Hatton and it was funded by uh, NSF, Codal and LR. This is a tool, it's online, it's, on a, it's available, uh, you can download it. Uh, it lets you um, look at directories on your uh, computer and um, assign metadata to objects. So you have a collection of files. Here's, a, here's a, an example of a, um, an image file. You can pull up all these uh, uh, files and then describe them here. And it will, this will then write some metadata that can be um, sent to an archive and uploaded together with your collections. So that's one aspect of making um, material more findable. The other one that's a big problem is transcription. Uh, we if, if we have a lot of audio material that has no transcript, so you know it's very difficult to know what's on it. But uh, there's a whole lot of activity, and you can see here just some of the uh, publications uh, and projects that there are for doing automated um, recognition of uh, text in audio. So taking an audio file recognizing uh, where there is speech and converting that into text or um, doing forced alignment initially but then doing also uh, transcription and progress is amazingly good uh, with this within our center of excellence we have a project called elpis uh, which has this interface uh, and you can upload audio files uh, and transcripts, it will learn the correlation between the audio and the transcript, and then you can give it untranscribed audio, and it will um, make a good guess at what the um, what the words are that it's listening to. So that's one way of enriching collections. Another way is for somebody to listen to them and enrich them in this way. So here's Stephen Gago again, listening to material from Papua New Guinea. A really interesting example over here is in Madang, we digitized a big collection that I showed you earlier of tapes from Madang in Papua New Guinea. And they then took them and played them at a market and asked people who were passing by to listen and to give feedback on what language it was, if they knew who the speaker was and so on. And they put that information into a spreadsheet and sent it back to us and that it then went into the collection again. So that was a, an interesting example, but doesn't happen too often. Uh, once files are in the archive and in a fixed location, they can be annotated. So here's, uh, here are some tapes that we digitized for Leonard Sam. Uh, he recorded them in the 1980s. They'd been in his house and we, did digitize, we had to clean them and then digitize them. 
But then Lizzie Wow was a, a speaker of this language, Jehu, who, who was living in Melbourne. And we had some fun. So we had her then going through and transcribing these. And she really loved doing this work. Um, in fact, she's still doing it now. She's gone back home to New Caledonia and is still doing transcriptions because she just enjoyed doing it so much. But you can only do this if the files are in a fixed location, like in an archive. And then the transcript can sit together with those in an archive as well. Um, so all the benefits of putting things into an archive. Another example that we have is that we've taken snippets of songs, uh, snippets of performance from the collection and, and put it onto a map in a soundscape. So here is our soundscape. <laughs> Sorry, I realise time is getting away. Um, so we can do this. All of this comes straight out of the archive. The archive has geographic information. It has the metadata information. We just took 20 second snippets out of the audio and we we're able to create this soundscape relatively easily because we have the structured information in the archive. So one of the problems then also for us is how do we get this information back to source communities, especially in the Pacific? It's very um, geographically wide, uh, spread uh, and uh, people live a long way away from even um, capital cities. So we do make hard disks available to cultural centres and we make our catalogue as accessible as possible um, on the internet, as I've shown, and we make low resolution copies. But if we take items from our collection and, take, and put them on a hard disk, they've lost all the information, the contextual information that's in the catalogue. So, for example, uh, if we take a collection of files to Tahiti uh, and we take from all of the collection of Paradisic, we take just those files that are relevant to Tahiti, there's no catalogue to accompany them, which means that people are just getting lists of files. However, in our collection, for each item in our collection, we write an XML file. And that file sits together with the items in the collection. So if you take some files out of the collection, they'll come together with this XML file. We then wrote a service called Data Loader, which can harvest just that little collection and put it onto a hard disk, or more interestingly, put it onto a Raspberry Pi, which is a little Wi-Fi transmitter. And you can put that into a local cultural center um, and people can pick up that signal on their phone without having any access to the internet. So this is quite interesting. We've done it a few times. We've done it in Australia. We've done it in various uh, Pacific Island countries. And here's an example in Erakor village in Vanuatu. So no internet there. Uh, people are using their mobile phones and they're accessing a catalog of information about their language, of all the material that was in Paradisic in their language, and they can download it, they can listen to it. And all those services that we saw in our catalog, we can replicate those services on the um, the local phone view of this material. So there are floods of records that need to be digitized still. Um, it's having having done that we work we can then work with speakers to enrich uh, existing collections. Uh, but we need to encourage better ways of creating records now and we can see that even with all of the good intentions and even with the funding incentives, people are still not depositing enough material in archives. So we need to build rewards for collections. Uh, we have the Delaman Award, which is given to an early career researcher for um, recognizing the work they put into building collections. We also, in, in the journal that I edit, we um, encourage citation of primary records. In fact, if you, deposit, if you submit an article with example sentences and you don't cite them, the article goes back to you and says you have to cite them back to a primary source. Um, we have to do a lot more training. Uh, we have to find existing paper and media rec records and digitize them and make them usable so that people in remote areas can get them. So having paper records, even paper records in national libraries and so on, uh, doesn't make them useful for um, use in current pro projects and revitalization and so on. And we need to absolutely create more archives and we need to present them in locally relevant ways. So ideally using local lingua franca um, using local geographic terms and, and appropriate metadata. So all of this is the, 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 the flood, the deluge ahead of us. Um, Paradisic itself uh, receives no ongoing funding. So here's my little 
advertisement that we are open to grants and donations. Uh, our web page has information about uh, making donations. And finally, I'd just like to thank many people. Um, this project doesn't exist uh, on the basis of one or two people's activity. This is, you know, the result of many people over many years. So thanks to these people and also to uh, these funding agencies. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to take any questions now. I guess you have uh, Mandana's question from earlier on. Yeah, so Mandana's question is, how can we get the hidden materials uh, into the archives? And it's a really good question. Um, we've well, so the hidden materials. On the one hand, we have the lost and found project, um, which is finding uh, particularly taped material. Um, but otherwise, well, we we need to encourage a sort of consciousness among researchers that if they go to an archive and find some language records, that they can make good quality. Uh, images of them and they can put that into an archive. They can get permission at the moment that they take those um, images to be able to use them in other places. They're very simple things that can be done, um, but it's really building that uh, idea into the into the, um, the researchers themselves so that they don't go and make bad quality records, they don't get permission, they only think of their own use of the material and they don't think of what potential other uses there could be of material that they work with. And that the speakers of these languages have a vital interest in them and that, you know, you as a researcher have a privileged access to archives, you have funding to go to archives, you have funding to uh, negotiate and, and standing to negotiate with libraries and archives that speakers often don't. They, they uh, aren't able to get to archives, they find them intimidating. Um, and so we can act as intermediaries and present that information. So there's a few things anyway, suggestions for how to get the hidden materials into archives. I don't know if you, uh, I'm just waiting for other questions, but in the meantime, would like to say that we have a bonjour from Hillary Chapel and also, of course, from Mandana, Sylvie Dinipour, who you just answered um, her question, and then also Sophie from the ALAR archive, mm -hmm. who says Very hi nice. as well. Yeah. So, Hello to you all. Thank you. Also, <laughs> there. Um, mm -hmm. So, waiting for other questions, I can maybe ask you one. I'm thinking of uh, all the work that's uh, been done mostly in uh, rich countries such as Australia, North America, and so on about archiving and um, getting those records. And I'm wondering if you're thinking at this point in, in the development of archives of uh, um, creating a kind of model that could be uh, exported so that uh, locally in, for instance, I'm thinking of Africa because that's where I work, uh, mm. in all those countries, um, for instance, consortia of universities could create their own archive yes. and uh, would have all this, yep. uh, all the building on, on the experience that you have and that can maybe be transferred. I think it would be really uh, yep. nice to. Mm. Yep. So there are a couple of things. Um, in the early days of the Dobas project, the, um, the language archive there did export. Um, language archiving technology uh, and computers to a number of different places around the world. And I, I know there were some in Africa uh, as well. Um, unfortunately, that technology has been superseded and the funding hasn't continued. So that hasn't, I don't think those archives are still functioning. I know that LR has been doing work in uh, sort of outreach work in um, various African countries. Um, I think the model really is that 
uh, people need to think about data management first and not immediately think about archiving systems. Um, if you can manage data and you have a backup system um, and you think about good naming conventions and you think about file formats, these are the important things. Uh, the, the sort of the infrastructure, um, if you have material in that shape, it can go into different kinds of infrastructure. So I set up an archive at the University of Hawaii as well, and they had a, a DSpace repository. And so we used that because it was there, it was part of the existing ecosystem. And each uh, university ideally would have some kind of archiving system, and maybe you can adapt what you want to that system. But it's, it's sort of understanding those issues, I think, that perhaps is where we can help. Um, and we definitely want to do that. And, uh, you know, we, in Paradisic, we've been doing outreach work in the Pacific, um, in particular, you know, as I've said, in um, Melanesia and in Tahiti. Tahiti at the moment is very well placed to build an archive, but of course, Tahiti is actually part of France. So they have more resources. Yeah. Um, oh, that's good. So Hilary has looked in, and discovered um, collections of Hakka and Hokkien Chinese in the collection. That's very good. So the, this uh, talk, if nothing else, has promoted uh, some of the collection to Hillary, which is very nice. Um, and the Jingpo, uh, yes, that's um, Keita Kurabe, who's a scholar in Japan, has been an exemplary depositor. Um, he has deposited thousands, uh, in the order of 3,000, um, narratives uh, in, in this language, with transcripts, working with speakers, using Paradisic as the way in which the speakers can get access to the recordings. So Paradisic also allows you as a depositor to specify access conditions. And if you want to, you can specify just a few people to, who can use it, or you can specify that it's completely open. But it's a framework, you know, it's a platform that has allowed him to make these materials available to speakers who can then do the transcriptions and that goes back into the collection as well. So yeah, that's a, a really good example. Do we have other questions from the chat? Please do ask your questions, otherwise well, there were so many rich and interesting things there and in your talk, many threads that, uh, and I know there are many people who are watching but not logged in in the live chat. So probably there are also questions that you might get afterwards. I'm, I'm very happy if there, anybody wants to get in touch with me or if you've got collections that you <laughs> you need to um, we want to archive you know we can we can talk about that um, our web page has lots of information so you know if you do want to please go and have a look at the deposit part of our um, web page mm -hmm. and we will um, we uh, we've already um, put the link to the Paradisic website under the video um, mm -hmm. in YouTube and if you have other links, we can add them as well there. And I hope we'll have other um, um, other interactions and discussions about archiving because this is such a crucial um, such a crucial endeavor for. Well, I, I want to reiterate uh, the the sort of the groundbreaking work that was done. At, well, at, not in your lab, but in La Cito um, and you know CNRS in Paris. Um, the work that was done on the Projet Archivage back mm, 30 years ago, um, which really informed my work and I used the tools that they created. Uh, so Michelle Jacobson's work, um, Boyd Michalowski and, and colleagues. And that work really, you know, was very early in the world and uh, in recognizing the importance of archiving, the importance of standard formats and of linking text and media. So um, I, I'd like to, you know, I take this opportunity to thank them again for, for having done that work and, and really setting the groundwork for the rest of us. Yeah, um, Hillary has asked if there's a, a long-term plan to join up all the different archiving sites. Um, 
the, so you know we have Delamun and Olac as these two overarching um, projects that do link us in some ways. Uh, Olac is is pretty good at this. So you know it does do this federated search over all of the participating archives. Um, but each archive has its own operating systems and its own history and uh, sort of ecology, I suppose. And it's not always easy to get an archive. And, you know, it's understandable we're underfunded and overworked to change. You know, the archive won't change uh, its operating systems just to be interoperable. Um, but, you know, I can see in the future we're, we're looking at some interesting developments in archiving technologies over the next few years that potentially could do a lot more to bring us into common formats and allow more interoperability between uh, language archives. Yeah, this is really beautiful to, to be looking forward to this. And I, even in my, in, in my career and lifetime, I've seen the development of so many things from, uh, as you said, the La Cito archive and what was done by Michel Jacobson and so on, and uh, everything that's, that's currently uh, um, done across the world. There's a huge progress has been made, and I really hope we can uh, go further in that direction. Um, or oh, we have another question or remark from Sophie at yeah. the you, do you have it in the chat or would you yes, like to? So she says that the virtual language observatory also harvests other archives and lets you search through them. It's true, it does. Um, in fact, I think it actually harvests OLAC data. So um, OLAC is the linchpin. OLAC is the service that harvests from archives. Um, and actually OLAC is very old technology and um, Delamun uh, is now in discussion to try and see if we can get some funding to revive and refresh OLAC, um, perhaps to also include the glottolog codes that I mentioned so that we can get an even more fine-grained view of the world's languages through these archival harvesting services. So this is about making them discoverable for scientists, linguists and speakers, which is yeah. linked but not exactly the same thing as having the recordings um preserved and uh saved from destruction so you yeah. have many different um tasks um in this archiving process and that's I, right yeah i think if you, if you don't do the if you don't do the um publicity and and make the uh, material available as widely as possible um then you're creating a second problem. I mean, we have these archives where you can't find anything now. There's no point making more archives. I mean, obviously we want to preserve the material and that's good, but there's a great possibility for each of these archives to promote the material, um, making it available through OLAC and these are also promotes it to Google searches. So it really does make it as accessible as possible because, you know, if I go back to my earlier um, slides, it's it's a we're trying to I think do a decolonizing of our work. Um, on the one hand, archives are sort of neo-colonial; they're taking everything and keeping it, and we're first world people keeping this material. But we can ameliorate that to some extent by um, you know this sort of notion of reciprocity of getting the material back to the places that it came from. Yeah. So you have a you have another question from Sophie. Or... Right. Yeah, I'm not sure. Can you read it? I've been thinking previously about how to set up citizen science projects for archivists. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yep. Of course. Yes, that's an excellent idea. Um, and yeah, we also have been thinking about that. So um, citizen science, as in making material available for transcription, online transcription. Um, ideally making it available so speakers can comment on it. it doesn't have to be a transcription but you know that they can say oh, I remember this song my grandparents used to sing this song to me and it's about this um, yes absolutely and you know it is a current funding application that I'm writing which includes uh, crowd uh, crowdsourcing um, annotation of existing archival material so yes absolutely and if 
you know, if you have some way of doing that, then um, perhaps we should talk about how we can combine our efforts. Waiting for any other questions from uh, our friends? Sophie says, or adding or translating metadata. Well, all right. Um, is that, uh, I suppose, is that um, the yeah. idea for crowd? Yeah, I guess citizen science projects. Yes. Yeah. And translating metadata into a, a local language, which uh, a local lingua franca is a good idea, uh, completely beyond our resources at the moment. Um, but individual depositors, for example, we have uh, a musicologist who works in China and her metadata is partly in Chinese so that people who find her collections uh, can read uh, the metadata in Chinese as well as in English. <laughs> I think also the all the visualizations that you made um, that are based in part or entirely on um, archives such as the 50 words and also this uh, Vanuatu um, presentation of the islands and with all the sounds there. I think they're very also efficient in uh, getting people in the general public interested in this and perhaps having more people um, wanting those archives to be funded and uh, seeing what the the outcome is. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, what I was trying to show with that was that, you know, having the material, once you've got it structured in the archive and you've got, you know, you've got files in predictable formats in predictable locations and you've got the metadata and you've got geography, you can just go through that and computationally extract information to make the soundscape, for example, you know, that was done very quickly. Um, but it's a quite a beautiful resource. And so, you know, you get 20 seconds of snippets. And I hope that through the talk, you got an, a sense of the different kinds of audio that's in the collection. Because audio files, unless you listen to them, they're, they're not much use. I mean, you know, um, listening to them is where you find the, the sort of the genius and the beauty of what's in the collection, you know. Um, and so exposing some of that with these 20 second snippets, I think is really valuable. Uh, in addition to which um, speakers, you know, we'll be looking at particular locations and saying, oh, that's actually, you know, there is some stuff in there from, from my location. Yeah, so building that structure, that's, I think, our responsibility to do that, build a good structure so that people can find information in their own languages. So Sophie, just like Mandana earlier on, says I'm nodding and saying yes, but you can't see or hear that. <laughs> Yeah, but um, yeah. yeah, and there is this, you know, there is a, a wonderful community of um, language archives in the world. Uh, we unfortunately we know each other, right? So there are so few of us that we all know each other. It would be nice if there were so many of us that we didn't know each other. <laughs> and, and what what would be your uh, um, ending message or call? Is it about those uh, tapes that are going to be? unusable by 2025 or is it what what would be your uh, mm. uh... well uh, yes so the tapes absolutely if you know of collections they absolutely have to be digitized there's you know that's a really urgent task but uh, the other one is um if if you're a an older researcher who doesn't want to learn new tricks that's fine but maybe encourage your students to participate in uh, training workshops and to take these issues up and we do have a number of older researchers who've deposited and are very keen. So I'm not, I'm not being ageist. <laughs> um, in fact, you know, there is often a, a sort of a sense of responsibility towards the end of their their um, their working lives or just after that that they need to do something with these collections. So sometimes they're the most uh, responsive depositors. But training uh, and and building an acceptance among younger scholars that this doesn't add huge amounts to their work, but it gives them so much more that they can do with their work later on. Um, they're building a foundation for their future. 
uh, and and being socially responsible and and making material available that the speakers they work with will be able to access. So there's there's sort of this whole virtuous um, circle involved in in creating good material for a language archives. So that would be my take home message, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Maybe I could add a, a better taking into account by uh, uh, scientific um, evaluations of uh, the value of building a corpus or building an archive and how it can be uh, put um, at the credit of the researchers because it's been so often work that's not been recognized. So that's probably something also that would be important in uh, our world. Yes. Well, that's right. And I, I skipped over the slide a bit quickly, perhaps, but, um, you know, there, there are two pieces of work, one that I wrote with colleagues here in Melbourne uh, on how to assess collections. So how to how to make assessments of collections that can be used in promotion, tenure documents, uh, job applications and so on. And the other one is on citation of data that a, a big group of people um, led by uh, Andrea Berez in Hawaii um, put together um, sort of statements and, and principles for citation of primary uh, data. So these are really important, um, exactly as you say, uh, getting credit for doing this work. Uh, and it's up to us in the end what we decide should get credit in our disciplines. So we can decide that a collection of research data has some value and we can evaluate it in some way, whether it's as valuable as an article or as valuable as a book really depends on the quality of the collection just in the way that we review books and some books are not much good and some books are beautiful. Um, so, you know, this is, it's early days, I suppose, but we're building up that kind of methodology. So that's something we should look to in the future as well. Well, thank you. <laughs> I can hear bird song in, in your background. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. So we have, um, I don't think we have other questions. I think it's uh, interaction within the chat between uh, several uh, members of uh, several colleagues who are watching. So I will perhaps uh, uh, let you go and have your aperitif and dinner. <laughs> and uh, so thank you. Thank you, Nick, very much for such a clear and rich presentation. Um, of what archiving means when applied to indigenous languages, recordings of indigenous languages. Uh, I'm sure many people watching us uh, now know more about these absolutely essential issues. And I hope uh, audiovisual archiving of rare and precious languages will become a more and more prominent domain in academia and in society in general. So I would like to thank very much all the people who watched us and interacted through the live chat. And as we're about to enter our holiday period, let me wish you all, on behalf of Ilara, a gorgeous new year and may 2021 be a year of hope, resilience and joy. And let's meet again on the 14th of January at 8 p.m. French time for a talk on ancient Maya writing by Professor Stephen Houston from Brown University. Thank you very much.